glorious, wonderful, hallelujah. Thank you. Be seated if you can. That is awesome. See, those are, that's, that's the truth about God. There is no one higher than him, no one greater. There's no one like our God. No one can do the things in my life that I need except God. He's the only, he's the only one that's capable of changing me from the inside out. That's a God thing. You know, we can try to affect things in our life and try to, you know, reissue things in our life, but really only God has the power to change uh, the issues of our life. And, and he says, come to me. In the book of Hebrews, he says, you know, uh, come boldly to the throne of grace. Uh, that, means, uh, that means come telling all. Boldly means not brashly or arrogantly. Boldly means uh, with speech or, or telling everything. In other words, don't be ashamed to say anything to God because God knows you. God created you. God understands every issue of your life. He knows to the family that you were born to. He knows the weaknesses that were placed into your life. He knows if there was abuse there. He knows what kind of things are happening in your life. And not only that, he knows what's going to happen in the future for your life because God knows everything. So he says, there's no reason to hide from me because I know everything. And just, just don't look, I'm not going to be surprised by anything you say to me. I'm not going to be ashamed of you because of anything you tell me. I know you and I love you. And, and, and just come sit in daddy's lap and talk to him and tell me what it is you need in life. And I'll do it. I mean, it's the throne of grace. Come boldly unto the throne of grace that you might find mercy and grace to help before it's too late. Yeah, that, that's, it's not a throne of judgment. It's a throne of grace. And God says, come on to me. Well, the enemy says to us, no, God is not like that. God is always looking for an opportunity to, to judge you and to put the hammer on you. He sits in heaven like a, like, like a dictator and this absentee landlord. And he's got the Ten Commandments in one hand and a bat in the other hand. And he says, come on, man, you break just one more law. And woo, I'm just ready. I'm, oh, don't, 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 don't give me an opportunity to just pounce on you. And, and, and the enemy uses that to keep us running from God instead of running to God. And it's an age-old situation. And what I'm saying to you is the enemy uses and has used this technique uh, for millennia in our life, for, for ever since the beginning of creation, to keep us separated from God because if we come to him like he says, he can change our life and affect the way our lives move in, 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 con, in conjunction with him. And so he keeps, the devil keeps us hiding from our healer. God is our healer. Yeah, yeah. And if, if, if we can be separated from him, then we will never find healing in our life. We'll stay separated from our healing forever. And, and, and of course, in the Bible, you know, we started last week dealing with these weaknesses that we have in life. And by weaknesses, I mean anything that, that you would be ashamed of. Uh, it, it might be something physical. It might be something emotional. It might be a spiritual issue. It could be anything in our life that we consider embarrassing or less than uh, perfect or, or a little bit uh, we're ashamed of it as something that we judge as being something that we wouldn't want everybody to know. And, and we, if everybody did know it, uh, it, would, it would be something we'd be ashamed of in life or we couldn't handle or, or we, it, would, it would make us uncomfortable that people would know. I, I mean, those are the weaknesses of life. The number one desire in emotions of all human beings is to be loved. And by being loved, I mean to be respected. I mean to be accepted in life. You know, none, none of us want to be rejected in life. None of us want people to uh, look down their nose at us, to walk away from us, to wag their head and go, oh, oh boy, they're just, you know. I mean, no, uh, that, though, all of those are rejections in life. And because love is our number one emotional need, rejection is our number one fear in life. We fear being rejected. Why is it that you don't live for the Lord totally sold out to Jesus in every area of life like the Bible says when you get saved? 
Well, it's fear that keeps us from living this way because if we truly live for the Lord, as an example, if we share our faith with everybody as we move along, uh, we might be looked at as something, as one of these holy rollers and It'd be weird in life, and people would look at us and wag their head and say, oh, man, I don't stuff there full of that. So, and, and they would reject us. This is, so, so fears like this are, are a very subtle form of control. And because we're fearful of that being exposed, we hide our weaknesses from the very one who could heal us in life. And so last week, I presented to you that the Apostle Paul, who is most likely the, one of the greatest Christians in the, in, in the entire Bible, who is certainly one of the most brilliant people theologically that has ever lived on this earth apart from Jesus Christ. I mean, he wrote 13 books of the New Testament, maybe 14 if you count Hebrews, which many theologians accredit Hebrews. So that would be 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. I would say that made him one of the theological giants of, of the whole New Testament world. And he was certainly disciplined in life. He was not out of control because he, he, he said, I was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the most uh, legalistic, judgmental, harsh people on the face of the earth. Their lives were completely under control. They were legalists. They were strict adherers to the law. They had over 600 laws concerning the Sabbath day alone. You know, you couldn't walk over a mile because that would be considered work. You, couldn't, you could pick up your child, but if your child had a rock in his pocket, you couldn't lift him up because that was considered work, and that was done on the Sabbath day. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable, all the tiny little restrictions on every single attribute of the law. And Paul said, I kept all of that. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. You thought the Pharisees were something. Boy, I could judge Pharisees. I was, so, I was so pharisaical, I could bring judgment against them. So he was disciplined to the nth degree. He was theological. He was brilliant. He was, he was you know, he had, it, he had it all going for him. And yet he had a weakness. And the weakness was, according to 2 Thessalonians chapters 10 through 12, Paul begins defending himself against a charge of weakness in his life. Paul has something happen to him that we all fear. And that fear is that our weakness would be exposed and that people would use our weakness to, to come against us in life. How many of you have weaknesses in your life? Let's see. All right, now hold them up. Just, I, mean, I mean, I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to say stand up and tell me what it is. But I just want you to look around and see all these hands up. I just want you to see. I want you to find out that you're in company. You know, all right, you can put them down. And see, you know what I noticed when I asked you that? It didn't take you a split second to raise your hand. You know why? Because all of us are aware of our weaknesses. They're kind of on the front of our mind. We, we, we know what they are. And, and, so, and, and so the Apostle Paul is our example when we are criticized for our weakness what are we to do? Well, the Apostle Paul uh, just comes right out and says, you know, you're right. Uh, in chapter 10, we, find, we, we, we found out what it is they were criticizing him for. Uh, they said, uh, well, Paul, you know, uh, you're a great person and, and you're a great, great minister and God used you to start this church, but, uh, you know, you're really in, in person and you write good letters. You write, you're a wonderful writer. When we get a letter from you, it is full of theological truth. It is impactful. It is powerful. It affects our lives which we all know is true because all of the books in the Bible that we have that, are, that, are, that Paul wrote, you know, the Corinthians, the Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, Titus, all of those are letters that Paul wrote to churches and to people, and they become books of the Bible. That's how, that's how dynamic they were. So the Corinthians say, Paul, when you write to us, it's so great, but when we see you in person, uh, you're a dud. Yeah, you're not really attractive. That's one thing. And, 
you, you know, your, your speech is contemptible is what the, the verse says, you know. And that means you don't talk good. You're a bad talker, Paul. So our, our um, suggestion to you, our, our consideration for you would be that you would send us more letters, but you, you, you wouldn't come by here as often as you do because uh, you're not attractive and you're a bad talker. Now, I mean, now that's hurtful. I, uh, I mean, no matter how you put it, that, that, that's a hurtful thing, isn't it? I mean, that, that, that's, that, that would be a rejection, uh, uh, totally a rejection in life. Now, what did Paul do in response to this? Paul sent him a letter. I mean, he's, he's writing. This is in chapter 12, just a couple of chapters after that. And Paul said in chapter 10, uh, this is what I'm hearing that you're saying about me. So he says, all right, I'm hearing that you say I'm a dud when I come by and so forth. And here's my answer to what I'm going to do about it and what I'm going to think about it. Now, remember basically what the Corinthian church is saying to Paul by saying he's a dud is they're saying to Paul, you need to up your game, is literally what they're saying. They're saying, if you're going to come by here and preach to us, you need to learn how to perform better, right? I mean, you need to be better at speaking. You need to be better in person. You need to become more dynamic. You need to learn a few skills about how to communicate with people. You need to go see a speech therapist and, and get that voice lowered a little bit and start talking from your chest rather than, yep, here like you. I mean, your, your, your voice is contemptible. It's aggravating. It's annoying. It's, it's not nice. It's like, moo, like, you know, chalk, we're walking on a chalkboard, you know. And so they're, they're, what their criticism is intended to do is it, is it is intended to control Paul's life. I mean, I'm just showing you the big picture here. The, the big picture is they're basically by their criticism saying you have a weakness and the weakness is your performance is bad. So if you want to correct your weakness, you need to learn how to perform better because uh, it would make us want you. But if you don't change the way you perform, just write us a letter, you know, do, do something. And this is behind this kind of concept is an enemy that wants us to believe that if we can just perform better, then people will accept us in life. And so what does that encourage us to do? It encourages us not to be ourselves, but to constantly be, be trying to up our game so we can please people by the way we perform. And this is a subtle form of control of our life, not to be what God created us to be, not to do what God created us to do, but to do what people want us to do by changing the way we perform and, and thinking in our mind that we can be accepted just because we uh, up our game. But the Apostle Paul comes to them, and here's what the Apostle Paul says. Notice in, in the first verse, it is doubtless profitable for me to boast I, come, uh, I, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, or whether out of the body, I don't know. God knows. Such a one was caught up into the third heaven. So he's talking about himself here, and he's talking about uh, in, in the town of Lystra, and I won't get into all that. He was stoned to death. The apostle Paul was stoned to death. The people of Lystra stoned him with stones. His body died right there. They took him. They threw him off a, 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 into the dump of life because they thought he was completely dead. And the apostle Paul said, when that happened to me, when I died, uh, I, went, I went to the third heaven. You know, not the heavens around the earth and not the heavens of the universe, but beyond that, which is the heaven where God is, the heaven of heavens. Paul said, when my body died, I went to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. Paul says, I don't know whether I was still in my body and God just let me see this or whether I was out of my body and my spirit actually went somewhere. He said, I, I can't explain it, but I don't know, but God knows. 
how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which are not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast. You know, of, of a person like that, I'm going to just boast about that. And I'm going to say God is faithful to his word that to be absent from the, your body is to be present with the Lord. Paul said, I'll boast about that because that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but of myself, I'm not going to boast except in my infirmities. Everybody say weaknesses. Everybody say frailties. Everybody say sickness. Sickness. Paul said, I'm not going to boast about going to heaven when I die like I'm going to be a big star because I'm the only one that ever did that. And you guys are going to just fall down and say, "Woo, you're so awesome. You went to heaven. I mean, he, Paul said, I'm not going to use my popularity because of that like some sideshow freak. Only thing I'm going to tell you is God did this to me, and, and, and I'm not going to boast about that and try to become some star based on the fact that I had this real big spiritual experience. But I'm going to just, I'm going to, what I'm going to boast about is my weaknesses and how God comes in my weaknesses and my infirmities to bless my life. Because none of us are going to probably have that same experience of dying and going to heaven and then coming back in our bodies but we are all going to experience weakness in our life, every one of us. The Paul says, all right, let me tell you what I do. For though I might desire to boast, I'm not going to be a fool. For I'll speak the truth. But I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. That's just simply saying, I'm not going to perform for you. I hear your criticism that my speech is contemptible and my looks are not good. But I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do about it. Nothing. I'm not, I'm not going to perform better. I, I'm going to just tell you that I want people to see me the way I am. And I don't want anybody to think of me in any other way except what they have seen me to be and hear from me. So Paul says, I'm not going to change my performance. I, Paul says, I agree with you. I, I, I totally agree. I am, I'm not good looking, and I probably don't really talk very well. And so he's agreeing with his critics. In other words, he's not trying to hide his weakness from them. He's basically agreeing with them and saying, you're right, guys. That's exactly right, but let me tell you what I'm going to do about it. I'm not going to change the way I am because I want people to see me the way I am, that I am weak, that I do have a problem, and, I, and that I'm not going to say things differently, and I'm not going to get better looking and better you know, performing and all that. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So the, the Apostle Paul is actually saying, all right, I'm not going to try to cover up all of these issues in my life. I'm just going to admit to you that I agree with you that I do have these weaknesses. And by doing this, the Apostle Paul is basically saying to them, look, I'm not going to try to hide from these things. I'm just, I'm just going to agree with you and totally say, look, here's, here's, here's how you... Paul says, I'm an example to you. Take my example. When you're criticized for your weaknesses, when you are exposed with issues in your life, don't try to cover them up. Because if you try to cover them up, it's going to push you into the darkness. Because you're going to, get, you're going to try to hide from God. Hide from your healer. So when, when, when you get criticized or when your weaknesses get exposed in life, my example to you is to just admit it so it stays in the light so that the devil can't use it as an instrument to push you away from God and, and, and push you away from others. 
and push you away from people that pray for you and love you and can help you and can move you in life and just expose it and let it sit there because God can do something about all of those things. So how do you become like the Apostle Paul? How do you become confident to be able to let your weaknesses just be exposed before people so that God and the people can pray for you and the people can lift you and the people can uh, you know, uh, come alongside you and, 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 and strengthen you and comfort you and bless you in life and God can just move in you miraculously because God works in the light. God doesn't work in the darkness. The devil works in the darkness. He's the prince of the darkness. God always works in light. So when you're walking in darkness, you're walking in enemy territory, and God doesn't work in your life in the darkness, in the, in the hiding places. God works in your life in the, in the light, where all of a sudden God's light can heal your life. So what do you do about it? Well, number one, you have to be able to see these weaknesses in your life for what they really are. So the first way to deal with these things, the first way to become like the Apostle Paul is to see and recognize the weaknesses of our life. Now, there are basically four types of human weakness in life, and these are the blanks that you get to start filling in, all right? Here's number one. All right, you're going to recognize weaknesses. So when you recognize it, then you're going to be able to say, okay, that's me right there. And when you can say that, it's going to basically expose, okay, I, I, I have this weakness in my life. I recognize it. I see it. So now we can begin to put it before the Lord and let the Lord deal with it because these are common uh, weaknesses that we all have. The first one is inability. In, inability means that, that, that there are some things that, that I don't do very well. I'm not able to do a lot of things. Now, if I ask you how many of you are not able to do everything you want to do, you'd raise your hand because we all have inabilities in life, right? It might be something that because we, it might be something that we've never learned. It's not that we, uh, you know, can't be good at it. It's just we don't know anything about it, you know. And, you know, like marriage, before you get married, you know, you can, you can try to prepare and all of that for marriage. But, you know, there, there are certain things about it that you have to experience and you have to learn. And it might be cooking or it might be, you know, some other area of life that you just never have studied, finances, you know, or or uh, uh, gardening, or what? I mean, these are just, in, I'm not able because I just don't know anything about it. We all have inabilities like that. We are, it might be something that we're just not good at, right? We all have stuff that we're just not good at. We know a little bit about it, but we're not good at it. This might be a silly illustration, but let me just show you what I'm talking about. Um, and, and you men can back me up uh, with, with this. How many, of you guys, how many of you guys have trouble finding things at the house? Right, you have trouble seeing things. I mean, something can be right before you can be. You can be looking right at it, and you can't find it. Right? Okay. All right. Uh, I, I have this problem. I, I can actually be looking right at something and not see it. And uh, Tanya doesn't have this problem. And so I can be sitting there looking in the refrigerator, and I'm be saying, um, "Where's the barbecue sauce?" And I'm holding the door and I'm looking at it. Now, I'm going to tell you what you do after 42 years of marriage. After 42 mar years of marriage, when you start looking for something and you can't find it, you just stand there and keep on looking. <laughs> because you know what's going to happen. In a minute, she's going to see you looking and she's going to say, what you looking for? And then, you know, you can say, look, uh, I, I, I thought we had some barbecue sauce here. And she says, and she's not there. She said, we do. It's in the refrigerator door. And I say, where? It's not. Uh, Tanya, it's not in the refrigerator. Yes, it is. It's in the refrigerator door. And I promise you, here's what happens. She comes walking by, and not, she doesn't even really look. And she just reaches down, gets it almost without looking at it, and puts it in front of my face. She said, here, here it is. And you know what I'm thinking when she does that? Uh, that's witchcraft, and I'm telling Jesus. <laughs> because I know that that wasn't there. You created that right there. I know because I was looking right at it. And it but yeah, but, but see, we all have inabilities in life where we, okay, so that's a weakness in the life of human beings. What's wrong with that? We all, we all are not able to do everything in life because that's a common experience. Here's another weakness of humanity. It's called iniquity. Right, let me put that blank up. 
It's called iniquity. In Psalm 51, now I guarantee you that every single one of us deal with iniquity in our life. In Psalm 51, uh, David says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In the book of Deuteronomy, according to the second commandment uh, of uh, you shall have no graven images, he says, you don't bow down to them, blah, blah. And he says, if you do, I'm going to visit the iniquity, that iniquity to the third and the fourth generations. What is iniquity? Well, iniquity is a unique type of sin. Iniquity comes from the Hebrew word avon, and it means to intentionally uh, twist or distort a certain standard of life. God has standards, right? He says, this is how you're to be, and he says, this is the standard for you to be. Well, iniquity means that you take this standard and you don't obey it, but so it begins to twist or misshape this. And, and let me just kind of give you an illustration of what happened. I mean, here's the standard, and here's, here's our family. Here's what we were brought up in, whether we were reared by our mom and daddy, grandparents, a uh, uh, home, guardian, whatever it might be, that's not living according to the standard, which most of us were brought up that in many ways fell short of all the standards of God. I think we could all admit that. But, and here's what it looks like, just, just a simple picture. Here's the standard. And iniquity means that I keep, I keep living life and I keep bumping up against the standard. And as I bump up against the standard, what begins to happen is over the years and over the life, my, my, my life begins to become like that instead of like that. I have, this is what a, the psychologist called a bent, a bent in life. And I'm, and, I'm con, and I'm conformed by this bent. That, that's iniquity. So what that's talking about is the environment in which we were brought up has an effect on our life. It has an effect on the way we see things, the way we do things, what we believe about life, in the character issues of life. Our home and our environment and the environment in which we were reared really does affect us in life, and we all have these in life. I mean, uh, the big character issues of wh whether I'm prejudiced or not, or, or whether I'm angry or not, or whether I'm fearful. I mean, all of those kind of big deals and big areas of life are, are infirmities in life, and, and it, it, it matters how we were brought up because infirmity is, a, is an area of life that all of us deal with. Uh, legalism, uh, judging, uh, unbelief, fear, prejudices in life, how we live our life. Because as we were growing up, we were, had like little cameras in our life and we were filming everything that was done. And so as we, and later on in life, begin to handle these issues in life, we handle these issues now like we were trained or being brought up in life. It affects the way we think about these things. I hope this would surprise you, but as an example, I was brought up in a very racist family. In other words, my experience in early life was to be a racist type of person. Now, my family wasn't overtly racist. They were just behind the scenes racist and would be judgmental and prejudiced and all that against it. And so that was the environment that I was brought up in. So my tendency would be, as I become an adult myself, is to take all of these uh, ways that I was trained and that the, 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 the motion picture of my life taught me how I ought to live, that I'm going to be living according to these ways. But that's obviously not how I feel. So what happened? Well, let me tell you how to break iniquity in your life. Let me show you how to change iniquity in your life. Here's basically the four things you have to do. Number one, admit it and take responsibility for it. In other words, if you have something in your life that is bent like this, it might be anger, it might be prejudice, it might be, uh, uh, it might be fear, it might be anxiety, it might be any of these issues in life, and you find yourself saying, you know, this is not right, this is not what God expects, so I need, this needs to change in life. I was brought up this way. Well, he, here's the first thing. First is you have to admit that even though your parents might have reared you in that way or you might have had an environment, the way you are now is your responsibility. 
I'm, I mean, this, I own this. Even though I was brought up this way, I make decisions about my life, and I have the right to change things in my life. So uh, I, I admit that this is in my life and that I am the one that's responsible for it. And then the second thing about admitting it and taking responsibility is that I have to, uh, I have to take this to the Lord and tell myself what it is. Just look at myself and say, I take responsibility, and this is sin in my life. Call it what it is. If I'm filled with anger, don't try to make an excuse for it. Say, God, I come to you, and this anger in my life, I recognize it is a sin against you. This prejudice, this, uh, you know, this, this, this way of, of, of handling, this way of stress, I mean, whatever it might be, just say, Lord, it's mine. I, 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 I don't want it in my life. I know it's a sin, and bring it to the Lord. The second thing is forgive your offender. Because if you don't forgive your offender, it's going to always stay fresh. Now, I know, you know you're, you're saying, well, it was my parents or it was my grandparents or it was my guardians or how, you know, wherever you might have been reared, uh, you have somebody that put these things in your life by example and so forth. And so there's an offender out there somewhere that, that created you in, in this way. And so you got to let that go. You got to let them off the hook. And, and probably the easiest way to do this is to just try to understand how they were reared. Because for the most part, really, many things that get put into our life, they're having the same problem we're having. They were brought up in a certain way, and then they bring us up in a certain way, and then we bring our children up in a certain way, and then our children bring their children up in a certain way. And, and, and for, for many times, if the more you understand about what caused that in your in the person that brought you up, the more you understand that they probably were brought up the same way. I mean, it's like you tell me about your parents and I can probably tell you about your grandparents. So if you knew the truth about them, you could give them a break. You could give them a little grace and a little mercy in life. Number three, number three, break the strongholds in the name of Jesus. Now, I know when you see that line, what you're thinking is, okay, here comes a big spiritual performance. We're going to have to break the strongholds in the enemy's life. And you begin to think about breaking the stronghold as being some kind of a something you do at an altar and you got to have this big spiritual performance. Breaking the stronghold means that you change the way you think about something. That's really all it means. It means make a decision. You make a decision. You say, I know this is a sin. I'm coming to you, Lord. This is not right. And I'm asking you to forgive me. And I forgive my parents for what they did because I understand that, you know, they need grace in their life. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be graceful because I want to receive grace. I'm going to give them grace. And I'm going to say, Lord, I forgive them. They are weak. They're human beings. They make mistakes. And Lord, I forgive them and I forgive what they did. And I'm asking you to speak truth to them. They're still alive. You know, God can bless their life. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm releasing that. And now I'm changing my mind about what I do because I know that that is a sin in my life. And Lord, I don't want to do that anymore. I want the curse to stop right here so that my children won't go any further in it. My grandchildren won't go any further in it. I want the curse to stop right here, right now. And I'm putting it before you and I'm asking you, Lord, change this area of my life. Speak into this area of my life. And I break the stronghold because once I break the stronghold, then I begin, I, I quit placing it in the life of my children, which stops them from placing it in the life of my grandchildren and my grandchildren's grandchildren. And for the generations that follow, now they are not controlled by this same spirit that is a sin against God that I was controlled by because I have broken the stronghold and that bondage is not passed on to our family. And the example is, look at Justin. Look at Amy. They've never had to deal with racism in their life. They've never heard their parents talk about different races in detrimental ways. They've grown up in an environment that is totally accepting of one person's worth as just being just as valuable as anybody else's worth. Nobody being judged because they're not a certain color or they're not a certain creed or anything like that. They've grown up in an environment that has no racism in it. Why? Because one day in the past, I said, I'm not going to be that way. 
That is a sin against God. And so God, I'm bringing it to you and I'm saying, I don't want to be that way. Change my way of thinking. Change my way of life because I want this to stop with my generation so that my children don't have to be like this. And certainly then their children are not like this. And what we've done is we've broken the hold of that in our life. Let me give you another example of this, alcoholism. I was brought up in alcoholism. My dad was an alcoholic for all of my life. My dad stopped drinking when, it, when, it, when I was 21 years old. So all of my life, I was brought up with alcohol in my life and alcoholism. Well, certainly that gave me a bent toward becoming one myself and handling life with addiction and so forth. Well, because I looked at that and I said, God, I, I don't want to live that way. That's not how I want to be. I, I, don't, want, I don't want that to be a part of my life. Uh, and, and I bring it before you and I, tell, and I ask you, God, don't let me be that way. And I made a decision to give it to God and say, God, I don't want that to have a hold of my life and I don't want to do that. Now, I, I don't have a problem with alcohol because God changed my life and I'm not now, you know, the son of an addicted person actually usually becomes an addicted person themselves and then they become an addicted person because they, we all, they all teach each other how to handle your problems is to take this bottle and, and, you know, solve it. But my children now are not alcoholics. If you took our family tree and you saw the limbs coming out, it would be alcoholism, alcohol. All of my daddy's brothers, which were about four, died in alcohol-related accidents, car accidents, or they drank themselves to death or whatever it might be. So this side of the tree would be full of alcohol. Here comes one little branch sticking out on this side that says uh, this, is the, this is the thrash, but this is the key thrash branch, and this branch comes out on the opposite side of the tree, and then Justin thrash and, ta and, and and uh, Amy Thrash, and then their children come out. And now, before long, we have a whole side of the tree that's not controlled by the same weakness as this side of the tree. Why? Because somebody made a decision and then surrender it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The reason we're bent to start with is because of disobedience against the standards of God. And so I basically just say, all right, Lord, I want to live by your standards and let God control your heart. So... The weakness of life that is inability, we all have weaknesses, we all have infirmities, and we all have inabilities in life. Here's, um, uh, here's number three, infirmity. Infirmity comes from the Greek word asthenia, from which we get our English word anesthesia. And, uh, <laughs> what? Anesthesia. <laughs> yeah, anesthesia. And an infirmity means a weakness or a frailty or a sickness in life. Now, sometimes these infirmities are uh, temporary. You know, we all have times where, you know, we're sick or we're weak or we're frail and something, and, and many times that goes away, you know. But sometimes it's permanent in life, and some have permanent weaknesses. Like the Apostle Paul is a perfect example. The Apostle Paul in First, uh, 2 Corinthians 12 said, Here, you know, I have a problem. I have an infirmity. I have a weakness, a frailty, a sickness. And he said, you know what it is? He said, um, uh, after I went to heaven, after I died and went to heaven, and I came back, God sent me back. He said, you know, uh, the temptation was to become a spiritual rock star. The temptation was to say, man, guys, I've experienced something that, whoo, you can, I mean, nobody else has experienced in life. And you need to be, you know, you need to look at me as somebody special because of everything that I've done and been and how God has blessed me and how I've experienced things that none of you are going to be able to experience. I'm like a spiritual rock star. Paul said that was the temptation that I had. So that that wouldn't happen, he said, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. And he described this thorn in the flesh as a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me so that, I, so that my head wouldn't swell so big I couldn't be used of the Lord. And he said, you know what I did? I prayed three times that God would remove this thorn in the flesh. And you know what God did? He said, I'm not going to remove it, but I'm going to give you the grace and the strength to live with this infirmity. 
So in punishing, and, and what was he confirming? Well, in Galatians 4, uh, the Apostle Paul writes to him in Galatians chapter 4, he says to Galatians, he said, you know that I was with you, I was sick. And he said to them, I know that if it were possible that you would trust your own eyes out and give them to me, it would make you better. So Paul, I you know, Paul is saying, I think, quite likely, that his infirmity was had something to do with his eyes. He, he couldn't see it. And he was saying, well, he could really trust him and he could have given his eyes. But the point is that sometimes God removes these infirmities of life and he sometimes he does it. Now, let me just give you one more of this here. We inherit, people inherit. Now, these are sometimes the most difficult to accept. And, and, and the inherent weakness is our weaknesses that are placed in our lives by God. We're going to, if we're going to change the weaknesses of our lives, if we're going to accept the weaknesses of our lives and not be ashamed or embarrassing, the first thing we have to do is recognize them. So here's the last thing. Uh, inherent weaknesses. An inherent weakness. This little tiny mite here gets wet, this wet, and it's wet. All right, Isaac, you got me, but, oh, so good. Hello, world, can you hear me? <laughs> Let me give you the inherent weakness, and I'll give it to you real quick. This is the weirdest one of all, and this is one that's really, I think, the hardest to deal with in life, that sometimes our weaknesses come from God. I mean, we're born with these weaknesses, or something happens in our life and we and we become weak this way because God um, uh, brings it into our life or allows it to come into our life. And let me, let me just show you what I'm talking about. When Moses was commanded by God to go and deliver the children of Israel from bondage, what was the first excuse Moses gave to God as to why he couldn't go and do what God asked him to do? Well, you remember what it was, the first thing God said, go. And Moses said, well, Lord, you know, you, you, you know I can't talk. I, I can't talk good, God. And, and if you would just, you know, hey, I would love to go, but uh, I can't talk. And, and then that was Paul's problem too, right? Because the Corinthians said, you don't, you're a bad talker. All right, now, here's what I'm saying. If you were going to design someone, you're God, and you're going to design someone in the womb of their mother to be able to deliver the children of Israel from bondage, to go down and speak to, the, to Pharaoh, who is the king of Egypt, the most powerful land in the world. Wouldn't it make sense that you would give that person a tremendous voice and the ability to speak powerfully, and to, you know, be creative in his voice. I, I mean, a slick talker, you know. That's what would make sense. Or if you were going to create an apostle that was going to become the preeminent apostle to the whole New Testament world, who to write 13, maybe 14 of the 27 New Testament books and be the greatest influencer of the kingdom of God in the entire New Testament, it would seem like you would create that person with a tremendous voice and the ability to communicate and be very smooth and slick in the way they could talk. But that's not how God created them. God created them both, evidently, with a divine disability. I mean, on purpose, God did this. Because when Moses said to God, hey, I would love to do it, but I don't talk good, what did God say to Moses? Who made your mouth? God said, who made your mouth? In other words, Moses, I made you the way you are. So what are you accusing me of? Mismanagement? You think I don't know what I'm doing? You don't think that I created you that way, and if I wanted you to be different, I could have created you in a different way? No, God didn't want a slick talker to deliver Israel. You know why? Because if a slick talker delivered Israel, then the whole world would say 
that it was Moses' brilliant, slick tongue that talked Pharaoh out of the Hebrew slaves, and it wasn't a great deliverance by a mighty God that delivered the people of God. In other words, God didn't want Israel delivered by a slick talker. God wanted Israel delivered by signs and wonders so that God could receive the glory and God could receive the honor for what he had done so that Moses couldn't go down there and, and, and represent himself and have all the right words. He would have to depend on God when he went down there because he knew he couldn't talk and it was going to be a miracle of God when God delivered him because he was not able and he wasn't able to talk. So he had to totally depend on God and not on his own power. And the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, let me, I, I think, no, I don't think I have that. Let me just check. Yeah, here's what the Apostle Paul said about his weakness. And I, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellent speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In other words, sometimes God disables an area of your life so that you have to depend on him. And your weaknesses, you have a greater potential to honor God and glorify God than you do in your strengths. Why is that? Because if in our strengths, we have a tendency to trust ourselves. And in, the, in our weakness of life, we depend on God and God gets the glory out of this. We, all, we often, I mean, it's as if we often look at God and say, God, why would you disable me in this area of life? Don't you know that I need that? And God says, no, you don't need that. You need me in life. And so just like parents, I mean, we are sheep. Not, not only sheep, but dumb, dumb sheep. Right? We need a shepherd. Well, we're, we're children. We're disobedient children. We're wayward children. And we need, a, we need a father to help us, to keep us, to train us, to move us. And so because God wants us to need him and follow him and obey him, sometimes there are divine disabilities in our life because God wants us to stay dependent on him. And he knows if we don't have these, we're going to walk away. Just like you parents, or we parents. Why is it that we parents don't give our children everything that they need as soon as they get old enough to have it? Like our 18-year-olds. Why don't we just buy them an automobile, buy them a place to live, uh, fill their pockets with money, uh, give them everything they need, and say, hey, go have a nice life. Why don't we do that? Well, it's because we have wisdom enough to know that they don't have enough sense to live life, right? Right? They don't have enough experience. They don't have enough wisdom to live life. And so we don't do that because we want them to need us so that when they need us, they can come back to us and then we can have some more input into their lives. We don't want them to walk away and never come back again. And so in order to make sure that they do, we don't give them everything they need so that they will come back to us so that we can input into their lives and help them have a better life. And sometimes God creates in us these divine disabilities because he wants to bless our life so that we can't just walk away and live any kind of life we want to. God wants us to need him is what it boils down to. And so these are the weaknesses of life. I mean, and I don't raise your hand now. Got any of these? <laughs> I mean, do those look familiar in life? Well, I'm just trying to tell you that we all have these. So as I look at my life, this doesn't become an opportunity for Satan to create an opportunity for me to hide. I just say, God, this is a weakness in my life. I'm, I'm like every other human being. I probably have the same weakness that lots of them have. And so, God, I'm not going to carry this into the darkness. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be ashamed of this in life. I'm going to just come on out and admit it and say, God, help me in my weaknesses. Uh, this is a sin. I'm looking at it the way you look at it, God, and I'm asking you to just change this part of my life because I know this doesn't please you, and I'm laying myself before you, and guys, come on around me and pray for me and lift me because I need your strength and I need, I need your love, and God will work in your life in the light because God works in the light and not, not in the darkness. So if you will, just bow your head with me.